Right, I think we'll get cracking. So again, welcome everyone to the uh, Cooperative Party Live call on National Grief Awareness Week. Um, tonight we're going to be discussing grief, uh, and bereavement and uh, helping to raise awareness of those experiences and looking at what support and help is available. So the, the sharp eyed amongst you will have noticed I'm not our usual chair, Anna Burley. I'm Rob Bates, I'm the Cooperative Party's uh, political and parliamentary officer and I'll be uh, chairing the call this evening. Um, fortunately for everyone on the call, you won't be hearing too much from me because I'd like to say we've been joined by two uh, fantastic speakers who I'm really looking forward to hearing from. So before I introduce our guests, I'll just run through some uh, basic housekeeping rules I'm sure you'll all be familiar about, with by now. Um, so first of all, just to let you all know this call is being recorded. Um, we sometimes find out our members and guests can't uh, always access the call, make it on time. So what we do is we record it uh, and pop it on our cooperative party YouTube channel so people can access it afterwards. So just a heads up, um, we are being recorded. So if you would prefer not to be seen, uh, here's your warning to, um, to flick that, that camera off and just go to audio only. Um, you'll also notice you are muted. Uh, that's just so we can keep the call clear and we're not distracted by uh, the dogs, doorbells or uh, carol singers as it may be this time of year. So um, just heads up, that's why you're muted. And um, once you are asked to ask a question, you'll find yourself unmuted or um, uh, able to unmute yourself and then to ask a question. So um, we're gonna have a quick presentation from our uh, two speakers. Uh, at which point we'll move on to a, a Q&A session. Now there's three ways you can ask a question. There's to click on the icon labelled uh, participants at the bottom centre of your screen. Um, if you click on the button labelled raise hand, your digital hand will be raised. Uh, I'll keep an eye out for you and you'll be able to ask a question when called. Uh, you can post your question in the chat box or you can send it to events at party.coop, which has been monitored by my colleague Izzy, who's currently hiding behind the, uh, the B that you'll see. That's events at party.coop. So if you want to email there, we'll, we'll have access to that as well. So as I say, when it's your turn to ask a question, um, I'll introduce you and you'll be muted and fire away. So uh, apologies in advance, we might not be able to get through every question, um, but the chat box is open for everyone. And I think given what we'll be discussing, I think that would be a nice place if people want to post their thoughts and uh, contributions and help uh, corresponding that way. That's, that's very much a, a thing you, you're able to do. Uh, a reminder, we want obviously people to feel safe and welcome, so to treat everyone with respect, which I know goes without saying, but just to please bear that in mind. So I'll pass on to our first speaker, who is Carolyn Harris. Now, Carolyn is the Member of Parliament for Swansea East, the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Labour Leader of the Opposition, the Deputy Leader of Welsh Labour, but perhaps as importantly, uh, a really great friend of the Cooperative Party and a supporter of the wider Cooperative Movement. Uh, Caroline is also a renowned campaigner, uh, and this was never more evident than with her remarkable success uh, fighting for the Children's Funeral Fund and the impact this has since had. So, Caroline, I'll, I'll pass over to you, uh, and without further ado, please feel free to fire away. Thanks, Rob, and thanks a lot. I can see some friends on the screen. I can see Tr I can see Trish, and I can see Colleen, and I'm sure there are other people on there I've met as well previously. Really interested listening to Rob reading out my list of titles because. For a very long time, and probably still for some people, I'm that woman who lost their son. And that's a, um, a tag I've had now for 30 years. Martin was eight when I lost him, and he would be 40 in January. And it could be yesterday, the way I feel. It never goes away. It never gets better. It never eases. It's always in your heart, no matter whether you've lost a partner, a child, a parent. It never goes anywhere. And it'll be every single day. You'll hear something, smell something, see something, think something, that you'll be convinced that you haven't experienced since the day you lost your loved one. And that's probably true of everybody. And when you first lose someone, you go through these different stages and when people say pull yourself together or you'll get over it or you know time's a great healer time's not a healer time just teaches you a very hard lesson that you will learn to cope with it so every day you'll wake up and you'll feel different there are some days i wake up and i feel like a 12 year old and i'll bounce around the place like tigger and i'm full of, full of beans and there are other days where I want to I wanna stick a, a blanket over my head and be left in a corner and nobody talk to me. And you can't tell when those days are going to be until you open your eyes in the morning. So even after all this time, I'm still very much grieving for Martin. And I think that was made a lot sharper when I first asked for the Children's Funeral Fund. Now, back when I lost Martin, I wasn't an MP, despite the fact 
that when I started campaigning for it, a lot of people on social media said, an MP can't afford a funeral. You know, people don't actually listen or, or read what they what's in front of them. But I was a barmaid when I lost my son, and my husband worked on the railway. Um, we were on low wages. We were just surviving like most working class families. Um, and when I was arranging Martin's funeral, I, I honestly can't remember arranging it. I can I can never. I can't remember anything about that time. I can't even remember his funeral, if I'm honest. I just know that about a fortnight after that event, that the undertaker came with a, a, an envelope and, and in it was the bill. And I remember going inside and thinking, where am I going to get the money for this from? It's just not something I'd even considered. I just never thought about that having a price. I just didn't think of it. I mean, as, as luck would have it, People in the community had done what we do in Wales. We bring tea bags, jars of coffee, milk, biscuits, and we'll have a whip round. And somebody did a whip round, and that whip round had brought a thousand pound. And then my husband went to the bank and borrowed seven hundred and fifty pound for to finish off the cost of the funeral, and fifty pound because I always wore on my neck a gold crucifix, and I put the crucifix on Martin when he was buried. And my husband went to replace the crucifix. We borrowed an extra £50 and went and bought me the crucifix. In interestingly, I've never been able to wear it. I just cannot wear it. I've got it safely tucked away, but I can't wear it. Just like I've got Martin's clothes that I had back from the hospital. One shoe, a pair of trainers. I'm sorry, one shoe, a pair of jeans, um, like a yellowy T-shirt and a, and a red and navy um Marks and Spencer's cardigan, a bit like the ones you'd see in American film where, where they were um, the old American schoolboy, that kind of thing. I can see it now. And that bag is hidden in my house. So I can't find it because when I see it, then the floodgates open and it takes me a long, 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 long time to get over seeing the clothes. And the last time I saw them was probably about 10 years ago when I found him in the attic. And I just relived and tried to smell the clothes to see if I can still smell Martin and I couldn't smell him anymore. And, and that was just too unbearable. And then when, um, when we moved house, my husband quietly took them out to their hiding place and hid them in the new place. I don't know where they are. I just know they're there. And I need to know they're there, just like I need to go to his grave, just like I need to talk about him and I need to think about him and I need to include him in everything that we do. There's never a day when I don't say Anne Martin or where's Martin or something about Martin because I've got to keep him in my heart, in my head. Because if I didn't, I think I'd go insane. So when I talked about Martin's funeral, that opened up a huge, huge gap in my heart that took me a long, long time to try to heal again. It is healing, but it's just like, it's a lot more sensitive than it was before. It's a little bit like having steroids cream on skin. So that skin gets thinner and thinner the older I get. One thing I know for certain is I'm not scared of dying. I know that there's something better for me. And I know I'm going to see my son again. And my mum passed away six years ago. And I know that she went knowing that she was going to be spending all our time with Martin. And that's all my mother ever wanted was to see Martin again. And I'm sure everybody on this call who suffered a bereavement have thought, if I could just have two more minutes, just two more minutes to say the things I never said, or two more minutes to ask the questions I never got answered, but just think about the last 30 seconds. How could you ever cope knowing that those 30 seconds were coming to an end? And that's what I think about every time I think about if I could just have had two more minutes, the last 30 seconds would be so painful that I don't think I could survive it. I used to say I would never survive another bereavement. I say this to my husband all the time, that I can't go through that pain again. When I lost my mum, it was really, really painful. It was just like losing Martin all over again. And I know that every time I lose someone close to me, it hurts a little bit more because I have to relive my grief in order to grieve the person who's gone. And I'm also rubbish. If somebody, somebody has lost somebody and I've got to go and pay my respects to them, I just end up crying for myself. And that's really selfish. So I don't like 
to visit people or to phone them. I'd rather text them, not because I don't care, but because I personally end up grieving again. And I don't want to go there grieving my grief when, when they uh, experience their grief. But we're in a very elite club, and it's a club that everybody will be in eventually. It's, you can't avoid it. You're going to be there yourself one day, and somebody will be having conversations like we are having, thinking and talking about missing you. But grief is one way of keeping that person alive in your heart and in your mind and in your dreams and in your life. Because if we forget about people, if we didn't grieve them, then what was the point of them being here? When we grieve them, we feel in their loss. We feel in the love that we had for them. And that saying, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. And my God, is that true? Because I couldn't have gone through my life not having that love I had for Martin because I still got that love and it makes me human and it makes me a better person so I don't know what else you want me to say other than I mean no you're in all in my prayers I just pray for everyone and, and anyone who's lost anyone you know I'm there if anybody wants to talk to me thank you Carolyn I think on behalf of everyone on the call that's thank you so much for sharing that with us and um I think all of us will recognize something within that those feelings in there it's something that we've all sort of experienced at some point and actually I think that's a lovely way of looking at grief in that it's not something to be feared but actually um a way of keeping them alive and uh, inside you in some way it's a really a positive thing so um that's a lovely way of looking at it and thank you so much for sharing that with us Karen. I'm sure we'll um uh, we'll some questions to you afterwards and I just want to bring in um uh, Linda as our, our next speaker and um uh, Linda is the founder and CEO of the Good Grief Trust which is a fantastic charity that that addresses these issues of grief and bereavement uh, and it does fantastic work in pulling the support services and provision from right across the country in a one easily accessible umbrella to help signpost those who need it. Um, Linda and the Trust are the driving force behind this year's National Grief Awareness Week and Linda I'm conscious it's the eve of that event so um, I know how busy you'll be so thank you so much for finding the time to, to join us tonight I know you'll be keen to talk more about the trust, the work that you're doing and the importance of, of this week coming up so I'll pass it over to you Linda. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. And thanks so much, everybody. And, and it's lovely to be here. And Carolyn, that is so, so Carolyn and I met three years ago, I think, because we both formed the All Pods Parliamentary Group on Bereavement Support together. And I was massively inspired by Carolyn's story of losing Martin. And I knew the passion and I knew her drive and I knew that she was going to be the right person that we had to have behind us to make changes changes weren't being made, improvements weren't being made, grief wasn't recognised. So I'm on a bit of a, a mission. I lost my partner to cancer six years ago. Graham died of a really nasty soft, um, soft tissue sarcoma. And I basically went to my GP and I thought I was going utterly crazy. I'd lost my dad 20 years ago this year and I loved him so much, but losing Graham was something different. And I used to just stride across Wimbledon Common where we used to live and scream to the sky, where are you? I didn't get it. I just didn't understand why on earth this man who was my best friend, who was next to me, who was funny, who was intelligent, only was in a pot on a shelf. It did something to my head. So I went to my GP and I said, I'm literally going crazy. So he gave me a letter for Cruz. He gave me a leaflet. I phoned them up. They didn't have anything available. And I was literally on my knees. I think the waiting list was at least six months. And I said, look, I'm in Wandsworth. What, what else do you have? They didn't have anything. So I had a friend who lived in Kensington. So I said, look, have you got anything elsewhere? And they said, yes, OK. So I just bid. I said, I lived in Kensington. So I went up to um, uh, Notting Hill and I did four lessons, uh, four sessions of counselling. But I literally sat there and sobbed my way through. And, and then I went home and I thought, well, what else is there? I mean, this isn't getting me anywhere. I didn't feel as though I was moving forward with my grief. I was still stuck. I couldn't get off the sofa. So I went back to the GP and I said, look, counseling just isn't for me for, what, for whatever reason it doesn't work. So he said, well, I haven't got anything else that sleeping tablets, you know, maybe help you. And I just thought, mm -hmm. look, I don't take a paracetamol. I'm not that person. There must be something else. But there wasn't. He had nothing else at his fingertips. He didn't have a database. He didn't have a website. He had no idea what else was available. And I just thought this is crazy. So I went out, I went out and I went to the Marsden where Graham was treated. I went to St. George's in Tooting. 
And I went into the Macmillan office and they had every single leaflet for cancer, every type of support service, but they had nothing for bereavement. And they said, well, if you'd like to maybe start a bereavement support group, that'd be great. And I just thought, well, hang on a minute, this is crazy. There must be other people like me across the country, not only have lost a partner, like Carolyn, who's lost a child, a sibling, a friend, a work colleague, we must be able to find them that information that's out there and those charities. Because I happened to Google and I found the best charity ever for me. It was a lifeline. It was called Widow and Young. It was specifically for people under 50 who'd lost a partner. And I thought, well, hang on a minute. Why didn't my GP know about it? And I went back and I went back to the hospitals. They had no idea it existed. They had no idea anything other than quite a few very limited charities like Crew, Samaritans, Child Bereavement UK, SOBS, just those sort of main key charities were listed on that bereavement support information. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, this is not on. We clearly need to give targeted support because none of those charities were relevant for me. I didn't want to phone the Samaritans, that wasn't right for me. And I was clearly not the only one. So then what I did, I basically piggybacked on as many different initiatives as I could. Um, the NCPC were putting together something called Building on the Best and I met bereavement managers across the country who again were flabbergasted at the support that was out there. I named charity after charity, they didn't know. I remember I went to, to one hospital, I think it was down in Guildford, and the, the bereavement manager had lost his own brother-in-law. And I said, well, sign poster to, to um, sign poster sister-in-law to um, Way, and he said, what's that? I said, widowed and young. And he was a bereavement support manager in a hospital environment, giving out leaflets every day, and he had no idea what else was available except what was listed on his leaflets. And they were really, really restricted. They couldn't even change, um, uh, you know, a forget me name on the front to a lily or something. It was just really, really constricted. So I just thought, well, okay, this, this needs to be changed. So we went out there and we found, we're voluntary, none of us uh, are on a salary, we're just passionate people on the board women who have lost their husbands. And we got together and we found, uh, we have now, four years later, over 800 support services listed under the one database. And that's if you've lost somebody through cancer, epilepsy, cancer, um, you know, suicide, whatever it is, wherever you are in the country, you put a postcode in and up pops your support service, a choice of support services. So that's what we did. So that's been running for four years. And alongside that, I was passionate that we needed to update that bereavement support literature. We couldn't rely on people just getting a URL and happen to find a website. We needed to make sure that if somebody left a hospital and they left their husband, their child, their sibling in that um, environment or at a hospice, or they had the police knock on their door with a, with a sudden death, that they were given information that would signpost them to the Good Grief Trust. They couldn't be left I don't know if uh, I'm sure a lot of people know, obviously Carolyn knows in Wales, the story of Rianne Burke. I was so, so angry when I saw this. Um, it's a very, very poignant story. She lost her little boy. She's just a mum in Wales um, with three children, her little boy, George, um, convulsed in the living room and he died in A&E, uh, just completely unexpected. They went home, the hospital gave them the leaflet. Nobody phoned them, nobody followed it up. Five days later, her husband, Paul, went to, um, to his wife and he said, look, I just need some fresh air. And he drove to the motorway and he jumped off the bridge and took his own life. And she puts that down to the fact that nobody understood, nobody acknowledged their grief and nobody reached out and gave them a choice of support. Nobody really, really understood. And that we have to stop. If, if it's not suicide, it could be drug abuse. It could be alcohol abuse. It could be children self-harming. There is so much support out there. So basically what we've done alongside the Good Grief Trust, we have this card. So this is the Good Grief Trust card. It's a really simple signposting tool. When you get something from a hospital, you may be overwhelmed with the information. Maybe those links are not working. The, the phone numbers are maybe not kept up to date. It's very difficult to keep hard copies up to date. So I wanted something very simple that would signpost people immediately to a choice. And it would always be up to date. The last thing you want when you're grieving is to pick up a phone and think, oh, hang on a minute, that's not a right charity for me. That phone number doesn't work. That, that helpline is down. The website's not pertinent to me. So basically, we've got a little plastic credit card. It signposts those people to um, support help and hope in one place. 
And this, thankfully, now um, we haven't got a huge amount of funding from the uh, Department of Health, but they have actually this year recognised that this is really important. So we are now getting this to every trust across the, um, the country. We're getting it to every GP surgery, and I want it in every HR department, um, school, university, funeral director, crematorium, et cetera. So that is the Good Grief Trust in a nutshell. Um, but the National Grief Awareness Week, which starts tomorrow, um, was something that, again, I was really passionate um, through the APPG. I raised it a few years ago and realised, yes, we have Baby Loss Awareness Week, we have Children's Grief Awareness Week. We didn't have an overarching campaign that will recognise anyone, anywhere, whoever they've lost and offer that support. So thankfully, last year we um, launched it again with Carolyn's help. Thank you for that, Carolyn. Um, and it was really successful, really successful. But clearly this year, it has been overwhelming. The support has been exceptional. So tomorrow through to the 8th of December, we are concentrating and focusing each day on a particular bereaved um, section of the community. Um, tomorrow is generally sharing your story because that's the campaign message. It's all about uh, how people clearly have been grieving in isolation. They haven't been able to reach out to family and friends. All those um, channels of bereavement support have been um, disrupted because of COVID. Um, and we want to raise awareness. There are two key, key campaign posters we'd love you to share. Well, one says distance shouldn't mean that we can't share our grief. And the other one is share your story. It could become someone's hope. And we know that that's so, so true. It's all about peer support. The Good Grief Trust is all about peer support getting to support people on day one. So we've got COVID deaths, we've got children, we've got bereaved parents. Saturday is all about men's grief. Sunday is all about interfaith support. And then on the, on the final day of the campaign, we're really lucky. We'll be at St Paul's Cathedral. Again, you're all very, very welcome to join us. At 5 p.m. we've got a national silence. It not, hasn't been ticked off, but we hope that most people will, will observe a minute silence at 5 p.m. on the 8th of December. Um, which will kick off the Evensong service at St Paul's Cathedral. And then at 6 p.m., we're lighting the dome at St Paul's Cathedral with our campaign branding. And we have over 70 buildings, including Blackpool Tower, the National Theatre, Media City, Lincoln Cathedral, all the way across the country, lighting up at 6 p.m. to recognise the support that's needed for those people who have been grieving this year or any other year. Because clearly, as Carolyn said, when you've had a bereavement, it can come back at any time, anywhere. So 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people have been impacted by their grief so, so profoundly this year. So we hope that you join us. So National Grief Awareness Week starts tomorrow. Um, and that's our, that's our plan. And we hope that it will continue year on year and grow because clearly it's needed. And, and we know with the impact of COVID that there's a tsunami of mental health and grief issues that will need to be addressed. So hopefully through our APPG, we can, we can do that as well. So that's us. Thank you, Linda. And, and just to, to echo it, it's um, a brilliant tool, supports over the Good Grief Trust. And my colleague Izzy has, has popped a link into the chat. So if anyone wants to have a quick look at that, I would uh, recommend and encourage them to do so. Um, we'll, we'll move on to questions now. I can see one or two hands up. And um, so others, please feel free to, um, to put your questions, whether it's in the chat or pop your hand up in the way I uh, suggested. Uh, Colleen Fletcher, I've seen you've got your hand up, so perhaps we start with you, Colleen, uh, and, and we can uh, unmute you, I believe. Is that okay? Fire away, Colleen. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and can I say thank you to Carolyn, who I know very well. I'm, I'm a member of Parliament and I'm her uh, colleague, and um, uh, she's always inspirational and I want to thank um, Linda as well um, and you're right Linda um, I didn't know about you and my husband passed away two years ago um, probably in similar circumstances soft tissue carcinoma uh, a secondary cancer um, very very um, poorly man and died in a hospice. Um, so we knew he was going to die. He knew um, he was going to die and had known for about 12 weeks, definitely. Um, I have found it really, really difficult to find, um, to find an organization, especially 
um, a, an organization that isn't assigned to religious groups. Um, my husband wasn't religious at all and had a humanist funeral. And um, it, it would be interesting, I, I, I don't know whether you are or, or whether that is an option, um, but, but certainly it really doesn't matter whether you know, you're religious or not. Your grief is very, very much the same. And um, uh, I, I wanna thank you. And I, I, I came on this call um, because I was curious and um, because I'm a member of the co-op and because um, I, I thought this, this sounds as though I could learn something, not just for myself, but to uh, signpost um, other people too, who, who come to me um, in, in dire straits, especially as you say, just lately. So if I could um, have all of that information e emailed to me, that would be absolutely wonderful and would really enjoy um, uh, coming along to some sessions or to whatever you put on because um, we do, it's very true, need help um, from time to time. And like Carola, Carolyn um, said, um, her, her um, her son passed away many, many years ago. Ian was only two years ago. There's someone on this call who lost their husband this year. And it, it, it's right, it doesn't matter. It does come back to you at very extraordinary moments uh, where you don't think it's going to. And I think we all need that help, especially these days when uh, we should have the help um, with mental health being so much on the agenda. Um, certainly uh, with, with grief, but, um, but with all of the problems associated um, with COVID-19. So um, very pleased I came on and look forward to getting um, some of that uh, information, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen. I, I wonder if just on the back of that, before I, um, before I put it to our, our speakers, um, you touched, Colleen, on the impact of COVID and we know that um, bereavement is hard enough anyway, but the, the implications of COVID have removed a lot of those safety nets that we had, ability to grieve with loved ones in, in, yes. in, and so on. Um, Trisha, who's also on the call, has asked um, uh, prior to the meeting, as someone whose husband died two weeks ago and is finding the stringent tier three level extremely difficult, what practical advice can be offered to ensure mental health is not impacted? And I think that speaks to what Colin mentioned. It. I'll just ask perhaps Linda to, to speak first. This we, we can't separate bereavement from the circumstances going around us can we and, and, and what impact has that had on people uh, Linda if I can pass it on to yourself yeah absolutely well you know I mean COVID has had such an impact on so many people not just obviously who've had the COVID bereavement particularly but but through all types of deaths um, they haven't been able to reach out they haven't been able to say goodbye properly um, and we've had two camps I mean we've been running virtual cafes now since lockdown since March We've been running them four times a week and we have specialist cafes as well. And those people are coming in to spend an hour with other people who have been grieving, immediate support, immediate face-to-face -face help um, from others who, who understand. And their feedback is, is sort of twofold, really. They've either, through COVID, had a, a bit of a safe space because they haven't had to go out into the community. They haven't had to face the world. Um, and revolving and carrying on without them and without those people who they've been, uh, who they've lost. But primarily what they've done is, is they felt completely isolated, completely alone and completely robbed of their grief because they mm. haven't been able to do what they need to do. They haven't been able to have their friends and family at those funerals. They've had web streams that maybe have gone down, live streams that have gone down. They haven't even been able to access that. You know, hospitals haven't sadly been able to even get their clothes out they've been lost um as i said the bereavement support hasn't been there for them and they've been so isolated and so lonely and it's so painful um so you know we just urge everybody just to see what we are offering and what all those other charities under our umbrella are offering because there is support out there you know we're running lgbtq cafes we're we're running young people's cafes we're running COVID, moving forward, Cathy's, for those people who are a little bit further along with their grief. You know, it's it's just getting that support very, very early on and letting people know that there is a net out there to capture them and to help them. 
Um, but yeah, it's just getting that message out because people don't have that. You know, they don't know, they have no idea what is available for them. And often they don't even know that they're grieving. I mean, we've got a new ambassador, Luke Campbell, who is an Olympic boxer, uh, won the gold medal. He lost his dad a couple of weeks before a fight. And he said, since then, he's never spoken about it. And the pain, the physical pain that he's mm. been through didn't attribute to grief. So often we don't understand the symptoms mm. either. And often mm. the health professionals don't get it. You mm. know, they, they, they hand out maybe, you know, pills and antidepressants and things, but that's not often the way to go. We just need to speak to someone. We just need to offload. It's not difficult, it's not rocket science generally. Yes, of course, grief can be complicated, but you know, I say grief can be complicated, but access to support should never be. That's my mantra, you know, it's so simple. We just need to get awareness. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Carolyn, I wonder if you've got anything to, to add to that in terms of the impact that uh, COVID has had on, on grief and bereavement and, and those experiences. Yeah. I mean, I don't think we'll know for a long time what the impact has been, because I mean, as a bereaved mother, I can't imagine you know, not being able to, to have grieved Martin and to have been with him and seen him and hold and held him and touched him at, in his last minutes and, and to have a proper funeral. I mean, that I just can't imagine how painful that is. But, you know, like Linda says, there are support services out there. I think the other thing is not everybody wants to talk about it. So if, if you are involved with someone who um, has recently had a bereavement or has a, had a bereavement a long time ago, they may they might not want to talk about it. It took me a long time to what to want to talk about it because it's too painful. So you have to leave it to the individual to either embrace the support services, which if they do is absolutely fantastic, and you know the the help is there. But sometimes people need just to keep it to themselves. I mean, I actually I grieved. I mean, I I I grieved and grieved and grieved and and wallowed, but. I never give in to it. I remember the doctor saying to me, do you um, to have tablets? And I wouldn't take the tablets. And I was determined I was going to fight through when I had a three-year-old child. So I had to, I actually sat in the bath one night and said, right, I'm going to make a decision. Do I do something to myself so I'm with Martin? Or do I stay for Tom, for Stuart? It was three. And I, it was it literally was a, a decision who needed me the most? And I made the decision that my, uh, Stuart needed me the most because Martin had my grandparents who'd passed over. But everybody's got to deal with it their way. Don't ever try to tell anyone to react in a certain way because they've got to work through it themselves. Yeah, there was, there was something in there that you said, Caroline, about people aren't often happy to talk about it and people just aren't comfortable doing so. And I guess that touches on um, the forthcoming week around National Brief Awareness Week yeah. and part of the theme that Linda's mentioned is, is share your story. Linda, I wonder if you would speak to perhaps the importance of sharing stories and, and allowing people to speak and making people feel comfortable in normalising that process. Exactly. It's all about normalising grief. I just put it in the chat exactly what Carolyn's just said. We are so different. Grief is unique. You know, all these assumptions that, well, you know, so it's been a year. You should be over it by now. You know, have you not moved on? All these terms are so wrong. You know, you never move on from grief. You move forward with your life. You take your grief with you. You take your heart with you. You take that person with you. You know, but again, last year, some of our campaign messaging was around that, you know, just because I'm smiling doesn't mean I'm not grieving. You know, all these assumptions, you know, there's no one face of grief. There's no timeline for grief. You know, there's no, it's not linear. It's like a, it's like a ball of wool that's just tangled that has to slowly unwind in your own time, in your own way. And it's exactly what Karen said. You know, the support services are out there, but they might not be right for everyone. As I've said in the chat, people come to our cafes, they sit there, they don't participate. They just want to be with other people. They don't need to talk. They don't even have their camera on sometimes. They maybe want to read an article or at midnight when no one's around. You know, we are different. We need to offer choice. And I think that is our campaign message. That's our message from Good Grief. We've never really offered people choice. It's only been through counselling. That's all you've offered or say Samaritans. You know, that's not enough. We are unique people and our grief is unique. And I think yeah. that really is yeah. can, can I can I just add to that, Rob, that mm. one of the one of the biggest fears of anyone who's bereaved is that you're going to be judged. You're mm. going to be judged by everybody around you. So uh, when I lost Martin, I was afraid to laugh. I was afraid to smile and I was afraid to laugh for a very long time. And primarily because if I laughed in public, then I was afraid that people would think that I didn't love Martin and that I'd forgotten about him. 
took, it took a long time. It must have taken about four years before I laughed. And it took my, my son, my three-year-old son, it took him two years to laugh. And we didn't know that he hadn't laughed until one day, about two years after we lost Martin, he made a sound and all of a sudden we realised that he laughed and he hadn't laughed at all. So we mustn't forget the children because children grieve as we do it, but they don't understand the situation. And I remember saying to Martin, uh, to uh, Stuart at the time, that Martin had gone to heaven. And I found Martin when he was older, he was about eight or nine, looking in the telephone directory for heaven because he hadn't seen his brother for six years and he was looking for heaven. We, we are better now. I mean, I would never say that to a child now. I would now say, tell him a version of the truth which they could understand. But, you know, it's, you know, it's not just us, it's those around us that are so affected by this. Yeah, exactly, completely. Yeah, uh, uh, just also again to encourage people to to look in the chat. There's some some really um, some good links and some useful signposting, but there's some some stories being shared as well. So I encourage people to also pop some questions in or, or raise your hand. And um, Carolyn, you you mentioned again about how sort of um, it's different for children and looking at the Good Grief Trust, which was an incredible job of signposting towards existing um, services and. I guess your the funeral fund that you campaigned so incredibly for was an example where that provision wasn't there. It was an example where people. Yeah. It was a practical thing. Yeah. yeah. Is, is there anything? Are there example? And I guess it's a question to both of you, Linda. You, you'll have experience. But are there current areas where there are cracks and people are falling through? And what more is it? The government or what more can be done in that particular area to make sure that where the children's funeral fund did an incredible job of, of plugging that and making sure that no one felt those experiences similar and I think Carolyn it it was the year anniversary back in July and I think it helped over 3,000 families which is just mm, mm, mm. astounding and but it, it speaks mm. to the need of that in the first place so perhaps to both of you uh Carolyn perhaps first are there any other areas that we, we we need to address yeah I think in terms of not so much the cost of funerals because they are what they are but I think some people in life um either not anticipating that, that a person is going to pass away so they haven't got the financial resources and I'm talking adults now or they may be on some kind of benefit and because people what people don't understand is it is a social fund but if the bereaved if the the deceased has an insurance policy then they can't then whoever's claiming can't qualify for the social fund there's all these different things that people don't take into consideration when they're actually organising a funeral because they they want to give the best to the person who, who's gone or sometimes just this week I had a phone call from someone whose mum has passed away he's on benefit and you know they just didn't have a clue where to start it's difficult for undertakers I've met a lot of undertakers who are in a position where they've had to do um, credit checks on people in order to give them the, to give to organise a funeral and in the hope they get paid so Undertakers come off this pretty badly because they, there is huge debt, uh, funeral poverty in this world because people not wanting the best of everything in some cases, but just being able to have something. No, it's one of those subjects that nobody talks about. We, if we had a clearer structure of exactly who was eligible for what and how much they would get, I think it would make life a lot easier for an undertaker when he's making those initial conversations around what somebody can have at a funeral so yeah i think it's structure and we need the government needs to put more money into helping people to pay for a basic decent funeral yeah uh, linda would you like to, to add to that yeah absolutely it's yeah clearly a lot of it is behind funding as well um, yes, we've got 800 services. Um, you know, that's not everything. We haven't got every single service under our umbrella. We've got a lot of them. But, you know, a lot of them are, are really struggling with their funding. Obviously, they, they've got brilliant initiatives. This is what really, really is something that we're passionate about, is that once a charity or a trust has developed a brilliant initiative, why don't we roll that out? Why do we work in silos? 
Why does that one organization spend so much time and resources in providing something? So for example, many of our hospital trusts are, are, are developing beautiful sort of possession bags so that you don't have to walk down corridors with a black carrier bag or a plastic bag with your child's possessions or your husband's possessions or you know, a little bit of dignity along the way. Those sort of improvements, the detail with the bereaved, they, everything sticks in their head. It can be absolutely catastrophic. So initiatives, sharing initiatives, just awareness and bringing people together. Again, not working in silos is massive. We're launching, as I said, these Good Grief Cafes. Community-based community services are absolutely on their knees. GPs don't, obviously, with the, with the effects of COVID, community services have, have been disrupted so badly. We need to get out there so those people who don't have access to maybe a device or to the internet or Wi-Fi, we need to get out into those communities and bring them together, hopefully, after COVID, safely social distancing and then hopefully in a normal world again but plug in those gaps because there are so many places across the country that offer nothing nothing at all there is no bereavement support um very little through the the trust because maybe they're a small organization very little through the gp surgeries and the community services so those primary health care providers they really do need help and that's why we're so we're so passionate to be able to get these cards out because at least if you've got signposting from day one and you've got awareness, at least you can possibly find something that's near you. But if you don't have anything, we need to plug those gaps. Yeah. So we're really passionate about getting our good growth cafes because it's a simple, so simple initiative. It doesn't cost anything hardly at all except an umbrella and a volunteer. And you, and you bring people together and it's so, it's so worthwhile. Yeah. Um, uh, Wendy Smith, I, I believe... Is that a, a hand up? It's not a digital hand, but it looks like you've got a hand up. So if, if you'd like to come in, Wendy, we'll just we'll unmute you. Yeah. Can you, are you unmuted, Wendy? Okay, can you hear? There we go, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Carolyn and Linda. Um, I've come along this evening actually wearing quite a few hats. Um, I was a registrar of births, deaths and marriages for almost 30 years. I'm currently a um, civil funeral celebrant. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I also have a grandson who is struggling at the moment. Um, he has physical and mental health issues. And this pandemic has made all of that much, much worse it's a real real struggle <coughs> and together with the families who've not been able to say goodbye to their loved ones indeed some families who <coughs> actually don't always know what their loved one has passed away from and i think this is absolutely wrong at the moment what the country is actually going through there's a lot of turmoil I'm actually <coughs> standing as a Labour and Cooperative candidate next May for the um, local elections in Peterborough. Um, one of the things that I do feel quite strongly about, which is building on really what Carolyn said, is that we do now have people who sadly cannot afford to live and they cannot afford to die. And I think this is a very sad indictment of the kind of country and the kind of society that we have become when that is the case. The current provision within the um, Department of Work and Pensions is a very long and protracted procedure whereby there are um, people who've passed away who haven't actually had a funeral for anywhere between two and three months after they've passed away. Personally, I think that is not acceptable. Um, it's, it doesn't give dignity to the deceased and it doesn't help the family in order to cope with their grief. Now, I do actually give my services free of charge where there are uh, families facing financial hardship. But the fact that I do that is not sufficient to help them out um, when they have um, no money. Um, one of the things, for example, is that often um, families are asked for 
to pay what is called disbursements up front. Now disbursements apparently average around about £1,300 and if you haven't any money £1,300 is an awful, awful lot of money. We have people in this country earning less than probably £9 an hour or whatever the current rate is and we have to start to realise what a huge problem this can be for ordinary working people. What I would like to do if I'm you know, elected, um, and even maybe if I'm not, I could still have a personal um, campaign, um, but I would like to see a funeral free of charge as a right and this would take away so much of the, the hurt, the anguish and the trauma for families in this country. What I personally think could happen is that most people probably work from age 18 to 65. Uh, some of us work after 65. Um, and I think for a f cost of something like £1.40 a week, extra in national insurance contributions would build up enough money so that by the time we passed away there would be sufficient money we'd paid into the system to actually personally cover a basic funeral which is probably around about £3,200 now. Um, I think this is hugely important as I say it's something that if I'm elected I will certainly be taking up with hopefully a future Labour government that we can get something moving on that score. Thank you, Wendy. Um, if it's OK, I'll just, I've seen um, Elizabeth has her hand up too. So we'll take a question from Elizabeth and we'll move on to, uh, to Caroline and Linda who might be able to answer them, them both. So uh, thank you, Wendy. Elizabeth, are you able to unmute yourself? Elizabeth, are you there? I'll tell you what, in that case, Carol, it, it, while uh, Elizabeth Hello, might Hello, how's it work? Sorry, I think it's Oh, worked. you're there, brilliant, just in well, time. I lost my mouse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I have um, just a, a point to make and a question, a couple of questions to ask. Um, the first one, uh, the thing I want to say, I lost my husband in this January, and it's been very strange, very, very difficult. And one of the things that struck me when I was arranging his funeral was the limit, limit of choice that we have for funerals. And my husband wanted a woodland burial and the I went to the co-op in Ipswich, Suffolk, where I live, and they didn't know really what I wanted and how to help me. They, I had to give them all the I found a place which was fantastic and it was really cheap as well. It was a thousand pounds for a plot and the burial and everything, which is fantastic value. And um, they they didn't know that this was available. And when you're in a grief situation, even though it was the co-op and they were very professional, et cetera, et cetera, they were selling me a product. And I just said, I knew what my husband said he wanted and I just got what he wanted. And I ended up with a bill of over 5,000 pounds, which I believe is not unusual. And the disbursement, the point that was made previous about disbursements, I think is very good because it's a lot of money. And I'm wondering if it's worth us thinking of lobbying for even interest-free loans for money to cover funeral costs with a baseline of, say, £3,500 budget. And the second point I wanted to make was that not everybody can access um, life insurance. Like my husband couldn't because he became ill 10 years ago and what he had was a progressive um, disease. So he was never going to be able to get insurance. We looked at a couple of things. No, he just wasn't going to be able to do it. And the, the third point was that I used to be for my sins as a counsellor in London, I was on the board of a crematoria and that was really interesting. Six local directors had the absolute control of all the slots bar a few, you know, those ones that you have a no frills cremation or what we were called, and I hate saying it, but pauper funerals and ones that the slots that the council could get like at five o'clock in the morning because the whole system was running. And it does concern me that Right. I don't know how to express this properly. The fact that there is so much profit in funerals and so much profit out of people's grief. And as a cooperator and and a Labour Party member, I feel this is 
if people want to go and have the full shebang and pay for a horse-drawn carriage and 5,000 different dis flower floral displays with everything you can imagine written on them and have 20 mourners cars, fine. If they've got the pocket to pay for that, fine. But the average funeral, if there was some sort of baseline that had, um, okay, to get A, B, C, this costs this much, you don't have to pay the disbursements up front, et cetera. And either it's a free loan from the government that you then have a credit agreement with the government, you're paying back a hundred a month. Like for example, my husband was under 65 and I didn't know anything about this. And a friend told me, you know, you can get two and a half thousand pounds grants, you, you know, from the government because he was a full taxpayer and under, under 65. I didn't know that I applied for it and got it straight away. And I get a hundred pounds a month for 18 months. So if I was on the never, never, and say I had the basic funeral that was three and a half grand, that would have covered it. That would, you know, the cost of it, which it, it has an effect. So sort of three points there. Um, but I wonder how people feel about this and if there would be support for it from our um, elected members in the higher echelons of politics to actually look at either interest-free loans or some sort of department that would assist with this because it is a profit-making business. A lot of American companies are involved in funeral plans now. And that's a criticism of the co-op. I buried my husband, he was buried four weeks and I started getting information through the post from the co-op about me setting up a funeral plan and you know their advertising, which I found really distressing. I thought it's the last thing I want to think about. And, um, and just the last thing, I'd never heard of the Good Grief Trust. Nobody signposted me to the Good Grief Trust. I got signposted to the old, the widows group in Ipswich, or the lovely women, they're all over 75. I'm 56, so I'm not under 50. I'm not that young, but you know, I lost my husband after 33 years and I'm just sort of stuck. I haven't, he's not my child. He wasn't, you know, anything like this. So it is a very, it's a very difficult situation to be in. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I've just seen uh, Trisha would like to um, comment as well. So perhaps we hear from Trisha and uh, I'll, I'll pass over to Linda and Calvin in, in case anything um, you'd like to reflect on uh, in those comments made. So Trisha, if you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Linda. I just want to talk briefly about my story, my husband's story. We went on our very first and only cruise in March and we got back just as COVID lockdown happened. And David had a cough and we assumed that he'd got COVID. So we self-isolated. Only the cough never went away. But we couldn't see a doctor because of COVID. So they assumed that, you know, let's give him some antibiotics. So antibiotics after antibiotics. And then eventually in June, they sent him for an X-ray. And that was the first time that he'd seen a medic. And I'm feeling quite angry about COVID and, and the way that we weren't allowed to see doctors earlier. And, and there's that, what if he'd seen a doctor sooner? Could he have been saved? Could his mesothelioma have, have been cured? Um, so I feel angry about that. Um, angry that because we weren't on an at-risk register or anything, it was difficult to get food. So I had to leave him. I was the sole carer and I had to leave him at home on his own while I dashed out to the supermarket. And he finally got a diagnosis in August and we were told that he'd got three to four months. Um, and during that time, once we knew that it was terminal, People were allowed to come and visit. They used to come and visit outside. We'd open the patio doors and he'd be laid on the sofa and they'd be calling to us. And we had lots of visitors come that, that way. But now he's gone, I'm not allowed any visitors. Only my bubble, which is my daughter who lives in Cambridge. And I find it so hard that I've got nobody. Even though my brother lives next door, I can't go and stand in his garden and talk to him. And, and I find the physical not being able to hug anybody, I find that so, so difficult. And even my husband's final wish was destroyed by COVID. He'd always wanted his body to go to um, Nottingham University. 
and he'd signed all the papers. But because of COVID, they couldn't take his body. So now we've got to go through a burial. Uh, not a burial, we're, we're having a service and then a cremation. And I just feel that COVID somehow has robbed me of an awful lot. But thank you for listening to my story. Thank you for sharing it, Tricia. Um, and uh, Linda, would you like to sort of uh, reflect on some of the points made? Trisha's obviously mentioned there the impact again of COVID, and and then Carolyn, uh, we'll we'll hear from yourself if that's okay. I'm so sorry, Trisha, and I'm so sorry, Elizabeth. Um, you know, it it COVID has caused so much complicated grief. It's so. I mean, grief is bad enough. Losing the person that you love is bad enough. But as you said, Tricia, if the, if you have that added burden and that guilt, I'm sure you're feeling, and so many people are feeling that they haven't, they feel as though they haven't really fulfilled what that person really wanted. Um, and that's out of your hands. You could have done nothing about that. That's absolutely nothing to do with what you want to be able to do for them. Um, so it has impacted so much and the, and the hugs are just painful. It's just, mm. it, you feel as though it's barbaric, but what can we do about it? We have to keep each other safe. Um, and Elizabeth, I, I completely understand what you're saying about the funerals. And we get so many people asking us, do we really have to have this done? And, you know, we really want more choice. And we've actually got on the website and we work with one of the funeral directors who's sort of quite forward thinking and radical and he's put together sort of 10 myth busting facts about funerals you know you don't have to be, have people embalmed etc so you don't have to go through those costs you don't have to do something I mean I used to be a wedding planner years ago and I'm sort of on the same vein as that really they used to present this huge sort of portfolio that you'd have to pay for and I'd say no actually no that we don't have to do that you can have choice it goes back to having choice and being more in control um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that you are. So it's hugely back down to public awareness, information. And, and as you said, Elizabeth, you didn't even know about the Good Grief Trust and that, that is not acceptable. You know, trusts and, and GP surgeries and community services and emergency services, they need to have that resource with them so that they know that they can signpost to a choice of support. They have no idea that it's not their job. It's not their job to do that. It's our job to make sure that people like you, Elizabeth and Tricia, know exactly that you are not alone and that you can have what you want. Um, so that, yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you haven't received what you want. But just to say that we've got, we've got our virtual cafes and you'd be most welcome to come along. It's a lovely group and, and we meet all the time. So please do just pop in. And there's so many other things going on, but just, yeah, get in touch with us. I'm so sorry. Sorry, Carolyn, is there anything you'd, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, to go back to Trish to start with, I mean, what happened with David, Trish, I know because you were in touch with me during the time. It was so sad and it was so awful. And, you know, maybe when this is over, there's a case for going back to the health board and see if there's any possible litigation for the way that he was treated um, and the way that you were treated. But what I would say is that when this COVID is all over, there will be a post-mortem, excuse the pun, over the way things have been handled. It's unprecedented. I know we've used that word a lot, but I don't think anybody can have planned for what we've experienced over the last eight months. And there have been a lot of mistakes made. And I think that there will come a time when we look back and we'll see what mistakes were made. And, and maybe the way that um, people, bereaved people have been treated during this time is one thing that we really need to be championing because this may be COVID now, but we, we not, when you've got something like a SARS virus, we know that we're going to have every so many years, we're going to have something like this. Ignore that. I, I am going to go vote. Um, we, we're going to be in a position where we have pandemics. That is the modern world now. The world's gone smaller. So they, this will not be the end of pandemics. When we get rid of COVID-19, within the next five years, there'll probably be COVID-2020 20, 20, 20 and so on and so forth. So I just think that we need to remember that when they're at the post-mortem, we need to have learned the lessons from this. And one of the things I, I personally will be champion is how death and bereavement is treated when we're in this situation again. And I've done some work with Sue Ryder. And one of the things that we've been looking at is trying to get the government to change the bubble so that if you were bereaved, that you could spend time with people, other people who were bereaved so that you could be um, consoling each other. And that's something that we tried to push the government into doing, but unfortunately we 
it's a campaign we're not there yet but you know this is preparatory work for the future um if i can come to elizabeth and say i'm sorry about your loss and and wendy i'm really concerned about your grandson and i'm really sorry to hear that he struggles so much uh, but when you talk about paying that extra national insurance, Wendy, I presume you mean for the local authority costs. Uh, and the local authority costs is where the real big problem came with the children's food drill fund. Because when we did the piece of work around how much children's food drills cost, the biggest percentage of that money was actually going to local authorities for disbursements. Because most undertakers the co-op uh, one in point dignity a lot of the independent funeral directors they were charging parents for the children's funeral it was the local authorities disbursement costs which is where the money went so um but then if you pay so much in out of your out of every week in your national insurance you would never do that with the child the child would never be in a position to be able to pay that so there'll always be people who will fall out of that net but as for the rest of the funeral, I think it's what Linda said, a lot of it is down to choice. So what might be, I mean, having experienced a few funerals now, I know my, my mother got cremated. And I remember when I went to sort of my mother's funeral and they were showing me these lovely oak coffins. And then the practical side of me kicked in and thought, my mother's being cremated. Why am I paying for an oak coffin? But not everybody's able to detach themselves like that. And because of grief, we all have to do it our way. That is how we cope with it, is by doing it our way. So if we want to buy an oak coffin, then we're entitled to buy an oak coffin if we can afford it. But it's like when Linda says, it has to be about choice. Um, and the, the funeral industry, if we're on about it, undertakers are probably one of the oldest professions in the world. We've always had undertakers. And you know, I think undertakers very often get a, a rough deal because they're dealing with the disbursement costs so they get blamed for the cost of a funeral when they a bit is only a portion of what the actual funeral costs I, I, mind not that i'm going to say all funeral directors are nice people because i won't mention his name but i have a dealings with one who belongs to um, an organization with a trade body which looks after um undertakers and when i had a meeting with him and some of his colleagues about children's funeral uh, cost when I was trying to get the fund he actually said to me that no you could never have a children's funeral fund because if you did that and we the government paid the disbursement costs then how bad would it make an undertaker look when they put their costs on it so he was one of the few that weren't prepared um, to pay a portion of the children of, of his portion but I've met very few undertakers like him who were charging for children's funerals but I like the idea of the, the national insurance I do like that idea but I worry about those who aren't working who are not paying national insurance who are too young you know I do worry about that section of society if you get over a certain age you'd exempt from national insurance so I do worry about those people who fall out to that safety net but um, I, I really worry about everybody. I think you, you've all got such sad stories and it really is a pleasure to meet you and talk to you all. Thanks, Caroline. It, um, it's something we could go on all night discussing, I'm sure, but I'm conscious the division bell's gone. And, and if you want to uh, need to dash off to vote, Caroline, we, we will certainly allow you to do that. But uh, just before you go, I'd say a, a huge thank you um, for joining us and sharing your story, Caroline. We'll, we'll let you shut off. But just on behalf of everyone on the call, um, a massive thank you for, for joining us and sharing that with us. So thank you. Um, before we, uh, I'm, I'm conscious of crept over, so as Carolyn leaves, um, uh, I wonder if we'll just um, pop back to Linda for any final comments, but perhaps before we do so, just um, a thank you to everyone on the call who's joined us um, in what has been uh, perhaps a difficult discussion, but I think an important one, particularly around what, what Linda says around share your story and how we, we normalise this, and I think hopefully tonight we've maybe done that in some way and, and been helpful. So. Uh, just a thank you to everyone on the call who's contributed and uh, whether you haven't and a massive thank you to Kelly who's gone and Linda also to yourself for, for making the time to join us so a massive thank you and Linda I'll pass over to yourself for any sort of final comments you might like to, to add. Yeah thanks Rob yeah thank you so much everyone and they are really difficult to hear but it's so important to do what you need to do and if it's sharing your story like you did Trisha I think that that can really help 
Um, but we know that grief can change on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, and so whatever works for you at whatever time. But I'm just looking at our Facebook page and our, our social media. We're not just a database. We're not just a signposting tool. We are a massive community. Our Facebook reaches 2.2 million, actually, last month. It's all organic. It's just completely amazing support system, a peer support. And I just want to read this, and I just want you to share this sort of quote to other people who maybe don't know how to support someone. And it says, if you know someone who has lost a very important person in their life and you're afraid to mention them because you think you may make them sad by reminding them that they died, you're not reminding them. They didn't forget that they died. What you're reminding them of is that you remembered that they lived and that's a great, great gift. And that, you know, is a quote that I, I use a lot and I want that to be sort of shared far and wide because so many people struggle to know how to support friends and family and they walk away and they don't pick up the phone and it's all very awkward and and who suffers that the person who's grieving suffers because they think that their friends don't you know don't understand or are not there for them um so so that i think if you can look on our social media and just share all those quotes they're so so helpful um, and again, finally, Julia, Julia Samuel, who I'm sure a lot of you know is the founding patron of Child Bereavement UK, um, says, it isn't the circumstances of the death that will predict a positive or negative outcome. It's the support they get at the time and after the death. This is the key component to anybody finding a way to rebuild their life. And that, again, is a mantra that we use at the Good Grief Trust. It's from day one, just knowing that someone's there for you, you're not alone and you're not going crazy. And I think that is really, really important. So anyone who's, who's, who's suffering, please do get in touch with us and know that you're not alone. And there are many, many people who want to reach out a virtual hand of friendship to you and that we're one of them. Thank you, Linda. I think that's the, the perfect note and the perfect thought to end on. So thank you to yourself again. Thank you to everyone on the call. Uh, look after yourselves, look after one another and we'll, we'll hopefully see you all again soon. So thank you all very much. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye everybody. Thank you.